Hello and welcome to episode 16 of Taking Liberties Radio. My name is Lee. Uh, today I'm joined by Vickers. Yo! And we are going to talk about uh, three things. We're going to talk about the Human Rights Council uh, with the new appointment of Rosalind Croucher. We're going to talk about uh, the some, somewhat of a push by um, the uh, one of the broadcasting regulators regarding Netflix. And we're going to talk a bit... What was the other one we were going to talk about? I forgot now. <laughs> Ah, uh, you kind of lost me too. Uh, give me one second. Uh, I should have written oh, down. a citizenship test. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start with the Human Rights Council. So that's going to be it. Uh, probably the most, uh, the biggest of the three things we're going to talk about. So, yep. uh, in the last twelve hours or so, um, there's been the announcement that um, George Brandis. Twelve hours. Was... Try seven. Seven. Well, in the last twelve, within the last twelve hours. So yep. yeah, seven would be within the last twelve. Yeah. Um, I'm not in Australia. I don't know when these things come out. Um, uh, the yes, the George Bradison announced that Rosalind Crouch, the uh, uh, who is the head of the um, uh, Law Reform Commission, yeah, yep. the Australian Law Reform Commissioner, yeah, uh, is going to be the new head of the Australian Human Rights Council, replacing Gillian Triggs, loved by all, uh, universal champion of free speech, uh, <laughs> of the common man, and his kitchen table. Yeah. Uh, so. The IPA actually came out swinging about how she was, uh, I think the exact quote from uh, Simon Brenny, it's a good mate of mine actually, uh, was um, that also she- Also a very well-dressed gentleman, always. Very always well-dressed well gentleman, yeah. yeah. Uh, was that Gillian Triggs is, sorry, no, Rosalind Croucher is Gillian Triggs light. Now, here's the thing, as bad as, I, I don't agree with Gillian Triggs, when it comes to 18C, uh, I think it's pretty clear that even on our show, it's pretty much universal. I- everyone we've ever had on our show, the universal consensus has been that 18C needs to be gone, right? Uh, and and I and I suspect amongst libertarians, uh, it, it ranges from this needs to be gone now to this needs to be gone, but there's a whole bunch of other really, really shitty legislation relating to free speech that also needs to be gone and we don't want to just focus on, hey, let the racists say whatever they want. So it's not as if there's any contention amongst libertarians that 18C needs to go. Um, and and with respect to that, that's the main gripe most libertarians have with um, Gillian Triggs. Because despite the fact that she is a free speech award winner, the Voltaire Free Speech Award or something it was, um, she's pretty weak source when it comes to free speech uh she supports which which is ironic for someone who's a human rights commissioner because i would expect someone who's a human rights commissioner to be erring on the side of something closer to natural rights as opposed to positivist uh interpretations of rights uh and and with respect to rosalind croucher being um selected she's not gonna be rocking the boat too much on that she is she believes 18C should be changed. Uh, the extent to which is something that seems to be something seems to be something she's not touching. And given the political fallout that occurred with Gillian Triggs, I don't think it's something she's going to be rushing to. Uh, I guess you could say um, explain her position on. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why. Uh, it's- you know that that she's not going to be a strong opponent of eight eighteen is because the government doesn't want to change it. So they're not going to they're not going to make their life hard by appointing somebody who's going to push for strong reform, which is probably why you know Augusto Zimmerman or somebody like him, you know, is a, a, a an academic in Western Australia, uh, written a book on eight eighteen. Um, he actually spoke at the the Students for Liberty conference in Western Australia last year. Yeah. Um. You know, he you put him. Yeah, you're going to get, absolutely going to get reform. With Rosalind Croucher, well, yeah, you're not going to get much. You, you might get some reform, the sort of marginal kind of reform that that uh, Turnbull's looking for. But yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a re- like people. I mean, there was, there was howls of outrage when when Trillian Jigs, Trillian Trillian Triggs. Wow, it's, it's like seven yeah. thirty in the morning. And I've only been awake for ten minutes. Sure, um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, she, she said something about to regulating. Tilly yeah. Jigs is a much cooler name. It's actually like a, an RPG kind of name. So I'm gonna write it that is. It is. It's it's probably gonna be my next World of Warcraft character name. Yeah, like a bard. 
Uh, actually, bad's too obvious because cheeks. But anyway, um, no, I, I get so where you're coming from. So yeah. Um, yeah, like the the reason she got the, the award was not purely well. I mean, obviously, ADNC is not something that lefties in Victoria are going to want to see change, but um, also her approach to refugees and and speaking out against um, gag orders, government uh, gag orders. orders. Like that is, which is which is important and a, and a libertarian issue and something that doesn't get talked about much by libertarians. Uh, well, at least well, that's not true. It, it, of, of conservative libertarians, you know, the ones yeah. conservative leading. So it's not something they they go hard on because, well, I guess they're probably maybe a bit more tolerant of the notion of of uh, of the overseas processing situation. Where I guess for uh, other libertarians, I mean myself, and I don't know how you feel, but you know, things like the indefinite overseas detention of people who have been charged with no crime is quite bad and speaking out against that is a good thing yeah um i mean that's a fair point uh, the, the the you you're right they they're favorable in there are conservative libertarians who are favorable of that refugee policy but even still you've got people like david lionhelm who does generally agree with the refugee so not necessarily to allow refugees in in large numbers um but at the same time, did oppose that policy of um, gagging uh, contractors, which is uh, quite frankly, I, I'm surprised is something that libertarians aren't more up in arms about. Uh, I, I understand you can issue gag orders in relation to cases, and that's something that I don't think would be contended. I understand you can issue gag orders with relation to national security. But that's not what's happening here. It's literally any worker that just happens to be involved in this issue that's politically sensitive is being told, no, you can't talk to the press. You can't explain what's going on there. And that's because Scott Morrison at the time wanted to have a single channel of uh, controlling what people hear about that issue. Uh, now... Shocking was, to think the government would have control the story about something that's uh, yeah that's bad and doesn't make them look good. Shocking, correct, right? it's correct, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's so difficult to understand. And 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 Leinhelm, to his credit, was one of the few politicians, and I say few because it was really just the Greens and Leinhelm, and I think I can't recall who the other one was. There was one more, but there was uh, sorry, one or two more, but there were. There, it was a small number of senators that opposed that piece of legislation, and they should be given credit for that. And Gillian Triggs was big about pointing out how this is a massive free spe speech issue. Rosalind Croucher is of that same school, but like we came, sorry, like we discussed before, she's not going to have big changes with relation to 18C. And 18C, by the way, is something, even if you're one of those people that says, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's significantly worse. 18C is like a thin edge of the wedge issue. Um, it's it, it has the potential of being very damaging. And it's basically lucky, I guess you could say, that the worst case we've had is the uh, Callum Twaits and, um, oh God, I can't remember the other two guys' names, but those three QUT students. That was, mm. uh, it, it's it's lucky that that's been the most, I guess you could say that's the worst ATC case that's been brought forward. Um, and based on how that occurred, uh, it's quite clear that there is a problem in the way the uh, Australian Human Rights Council is currently managed. Now, is Rosalind Croucher the solution to that, um, considering she comes from the same cloth? Maybe. But it's incremental change, like you said, which is what mm. Malcolm Turnbull wants. And it might be a step in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Any any further thoughts on uh, Rosalind Croucher? Uh, I, w I would actually love to see her at one of our libertarian events. It would be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we've had Augusto Zimmerman there before. So... Mm. I mean, it seems strange that um, libertarians aren't able to get someone from the Human Rights Council to ever yeah. come to one of our events. I'm just like, hey, um, you're talking about a group of people who obsess over human rights uh, yep. and lawyers who technically defend them. I, I, I'd imagine we'd be the key constituency that they want to try and court, but apparently the key constituencies they want to court are authoritarian lefties. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Take that oh, as you we'll, will. I guess we'll see. It depends. Yeah, well, Who knows? Maybe, maybe it's a type of reach out, right? Mm, mm. 
Probably never, but anyway, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, the, uh, the cultural the content. content. Uh, yep. yeah. This thing's a joke. So, it, it is a joke. It is a very unfunny joke, but it is a joke. Um, so uh, there is. Oh, now let me just. I think it was uh, ACMA, if I recall correctly. There's, there's yes, a. So the, yep. the thing is, it's it. This is an archaic yes, law, and it should. Communications media authority. Yes, yep. ACMA. That was the one. Yep. yep. Uh, and I kept thinking the advertising standards bureau for some reason, and I'm like, why? It's not that. Why would they? They know, don't involve that. themselves in this. No. So this this is actually an archaic law that is based around back ages and ages ago when they first started drafting up all of the TV licensing policies. So the hangover of that is that um, basically if you want to have an Australian TV license, you must show Australian content, Australian made content. And if you really get down to it, this is basically a form of, um, you know, that nationalistic sort of protectionism for the arts and culture industry. Uh, Mm. And it is protectionism. Um, But, like every country technically does it, but like you know, I suppose nowadays it's less and less relevant when you've got online broadcasting like Stan, like Netflix, like HBO. That's it, yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, it, every time that that a government forces a carrier to provide this sort of stuff, it's a millstone around their ability to produce other content that actually people want, or to source overseas content that people want. So, you know, I mean, Netflix has a lot of crap on it and so i'm sure stan does as well um but one of the reasons you know why it's so good is they can just say well this is what people want let's just give them that let's not worry about producing some crap show that gets shown at sunday afternoon at two o'clock in the arvo like it's just they can focus on actually stuff that people want yeah that's probably the most succinct way to put it i mean realistically it's not as if australian content is bad right there is definitely good australian content and we find that that's there in the commercial space and some of that's in the abc as well uh but keep in mind even a broken clock can strike twice yeah. sorry broken clock is right twice bah, i screwed up that analogy but the point is um right even the abc can occasionally get a hit on its hands chaser is another example of that um is starting again tonight tomorrow night tomorrow night yeah right. i know looking forward to it yep good show yeah, so uh, and you should definitely watch Utopia because it is actually completely emblematic of how Australian public service works. It's, it's the most libertarian, libertarian show on TV. Accidentally, it's, it's accidentally, accidentally libertarian. Yeah, I mean it's it's basically unsurprisingly it's produced by the same guys who made the castle, and like the castle is a libertarian classic because it just shows up the absurdity of the system. Yeah, but again, so, it's accidentally libertarian, right? Like, we keep getting to this. Like, these guys are not libertarians. They just yeah. happen to have viewpoints on these particular issues that lead them to libertarianism, which I, I find fantastic and intriguing. But to get, get to get to the point, like, yeah. you know, um, the, ma- the primary issue here is that you've got this piece of legislation that has not taken into account uh, technology, right? And mm. Basically, as a result of it, you've got this you, – you've now run a round end against these TV licenses um, and effectively provided people with a whole bunch of content ignoring this archaic restriction that they put into place. Now, I I would love to see this case actually go to court because technically, I don't think Netflix or Stan or any of these online streaming services – have TV licenses and they're not mm. technically TV. Um, and I would love to see nothing more than ACMA gets slapped across the face and told that they're performing a case of regulatory overreach. Sure. I, I mean, I, I suspect, I mean, the, the article, the news article that was shared in the Australian Libertarian Forum, um, it's talking about the government, you know, debating within the government. So ACMA is obviously presenting the case to the government and the government will need to legislate um to to sort of expand but i mean that would that would entail an expansion it's not just let's let's modify the regulation it's let's expand the regulation so acma is then covering the internet now i presume that have some sort of say in how newspapers uh go about their business like i'm pretty sure acma is the one which deals with complaints uh with some complaints about the media uh, in which case, I guess to that extent, they're not. It's not wholly uncharted territory that they've never had any any, any say about what's on the internet. But um, yeah, it's 
I mean, if you're starting to regulate the content of the internet through ACMA, you're going to say, well, where does that stop? You know, if it starts with Netflix, um, you know, at what point can does ACMA not get to say what people get to say on, on what people can and can't do on the internet? Uh, so, I mean, it's it probably sounds a little bit tinfoil hat to say this is the beginning, you know, the beginning of you know, the government telling what people can and can't say and can and can't do on the internet, but you never know with these things. You never know when programs start off as one thing, they can always end up as another, so. Yeah, I mean, if you keep in mind, where did this start from, right? Like, this started from requiring Australian content to be shown on TV, and you're looking at it expanding out now to internet. So, it's not... I don't think you're going too much into tinfoil territory, personally. Mm. I'm just saying, based mm. on based on just the slippery slope that's occurred so far, you're not too far off from suggesting that, hey, maybe ACMA does want to regulate the internet. Um, so it would be kind of like a, a, a ministry of truth. They, they see themselves mm. kind of like as a ministry of truth. Uh, yeah. and, and, and I know that the 1984 references always run rife amongst libertarians, but the, so, in this case, it really is an issue where they want to determine if all the media that's being consumed follows their guidelines. Hmm. So, I guess the, you know, when thinking about how we talk about this with non-libertarians, because a lot of people will be like, yeah, they really should be forced to play, you know, broadcast and stuff. I know my, I've had a number of discussions with my dad in particular, who's a big fan of the ABC, and is always going on about, you know, we'd never have all this stuff if it wasn't for the ABC. So, well, you know, what's the libertarian solution to Australian content? Uh, you know, how should we... Is it simply just tough shit, your crappy TV show? No, 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 that's... Or, like, what's the, what's the... No, no, absolutely not. In fact, I, I, I'm actually inclined to say the other direction. I mean, a lot of... Um, there's a lot of shows in Australia that have begun because someone just knew someone at, uh, you know, at one of the TV stations or something like that and just got their TV show on there. That's, I mean, that's the that's the story of how, what was it, Fat Pizza ended up starting off in the SBS. It's not like they went out and, you know, actually sourced the stuff. There was just a guy who sent in a video and went, hey, this is what I think of, this is what I think would be funny. Um, mm. So it's not, even the ABC doesn't do like open casting calls and stuff like that to, to really create their shows. I mean, they have pitch meetings and stuff like that, but a lot of their shows is just organically sourced through what's available. Uh, Danger Five is another example as well. Um, it's not at which all the case- Which is a ca- really weird show. Which is a really weird show. It is not at all <laughs> the case that Australian content would vanish. In fact, actually, if you take a look at one of Australia's biggest stars on YouTube, Bearing, right? That guy literally came out of nowhere, right? It's just a dude- who got really pissed on a Friday night and decided, I think that, sorry, I, I might be verbaling him here, but there was the story, like the story on his channel was basically, I just got really pissed on a Friday night and made a video and people yeah. liked it. So it's not as if Australian content dies when you cease funding the ABC. What happens is you get more control over what content rises up to the top. Right, right now yeah. it's basically, for example, in Triple J, it's the the Mills Mafia, right, that determines what music gets played on there. I would like to have a little bit of control personally on you know what music gets played on my radio station, and because mm. I like to be a control freak in that manner, I pay for something like Spotify and I get exactly the music I want, right? Yeah. So I'm someone who actively doesn't listen to to, to to Triple J, right? It's not as if I don't listen to the hipster music; it's just I don't have to wait till Mills gets around to listening to it. Yeah. Um, so it's the same thing, same concept with the ABC. You might not actually have to wait uh, until the ABC makes the determination of, hey, this is a good show before you watch it. Uh, I mean, it's probably worth recognizing also that when you have a quota, you have to fill it. So, I mean, when you watch, when you look at the TV guide on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon, there's like gardening shows, which are basically advertising things. You know, there's all sorts of just crap. I mean, there's, I mean, even, um, I'm trying to think, I think there was like, when they used to have a religious quota, the way they satisfied it was by showing all those- uh, Religious you know, shows uh, at like 4am in the morning. Show. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, like it's, 
you know, and if when you start moving talking about um, content on the the digital channels, um, you know, the, the 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 mates and all the rest of it, you know, you can have a lot of crap which they're being forced to fund because they've got to fill their quota. I mean, I suspect to uh, uh, I would say, I'm not even that against it, but Home and Away, you know, Home and Away would still exist. It, it's a crap show, but like people will like it. It's going to keep getting shown. Well, There's no, lots that's, of stuff from those high rating shows. ABC. Sorry, yeah, those high rating uh, shows oh, have a problem. Yeah, and I mean, on the ABC, you've got a lot of dramas. There's like Rake, and there's like Jack Irish, and all these other sort of, uh, you know, relatively high profile dramas. That that's what the ABC does. I mean, I suspect those will still exist because that's kind of how they pitch their niche. I mean, that's the stuff. That, the stuff that gets prime time is probably going to continue to be prime time. It's lots of yep. other stuff that is not prime time that no one gives a shit about. That they don't have to fund. They can. I mean, they probably will be funded with cheaper overseas crap. But it's cheaper overseas crap. That means there's more money for other things. But you're not, I was going to say, you're not technically correct that there's nothing that changes on primetime. So one of the reasons why, uh, and you, you might, you're now in Canada and you will probably notice this, is you're probably a season behind if you're watching Australian TV, right? On, uh, a, lo- on, on, on a lot of like American shows. Oh, like, I don't know. I haven't watched it. I haven't had uh, time to watch anything. This guy. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right, so I've caught up on the Walking Dead that's on on Netflix, which is great. So yeah, there you go. Right, but 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 my point is, but the Netflix one would be up to the same season we're up to now. Yeah. Right, showing yeah. in Australia. So the thing is, there's a lot of shows, and it, it, so The Walking Dead's actually not a good example of it, but and neither is Game of Thrones. But if you take yeah. um. Like my 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 favorite go to example is The Simpsons. Right. So we do not get. When they talk about the latest episode of The Simpsons here in Australia, they're talking one season behind what the United States is up to. And that's because mm. The Simpsons is now shown on one of their shittier, you know, those digital channels, right? Yeah. But if you go to the States or if you go anywhere outside of Australia, hell, even Singapore, forget Singapore, actually, go to Jakarta, right? So Indonesia, you will get the latest episode there. And that's because they don't have the same cultural content restriction. This cultural, the, so the thing is, Australian shows cost money. Right, and that's mm. money that's taken away from other things. So, yep. one of the things that people complain about when they say, "Oh, I'm pirating this because we don't get the latest episodes here," it's because the cultural content is the cultural content restriction is actually reducing the amount of money that goes towards mm. other shows that you want to watch as well. So, yep. and, and the answer is like, and, and the answer to some degree would probably be, "Hey, if we got rid of the cultural content, would Australian good Australian shows disappear?" And the answer is no. Uh, but the other thing is also, would the approval of new shows go down? Um, and I think in, in in a lot of cases, that would be a yes. But my response to that would be, I don't think we want the ABC... Sorry, I don't think we want Australian broadcasters to take higher risks on Australian content just because we're telling them. And I would tell artists who are, who are going like, I'm making a, a, a risky, you know, artistic venture here. I would tell them, have you considered putting it on YouTube, right? Because mm. your avenues aren't just primetime broadcasting or nothing anymore. You have a whole bunch of other avenues. You've got YouTube, Vimeo, you know, a whole bunch of other systems in place. Mm. I mean, I, I guess what you really want is probably broader reform in this area. I mean, I mean, telecommunications regulation is a whole, probably a whole separate show. Um, yeah. But, you know, re- realistically, if you want to reform the cultural content stuff, you could probably go well, it would probably go better if you actually reformed how, say, Spectrum is allocated. Because one of the issues is, you know, you need a license to be a TV station. Well, what if you didn't need a license to be a TV station? What if you just needed, you just could buy Spectrum from the person who owns the Spectrum and then you can set up your own TV station? And then if you want to have nothing but shitty gardening shows 24-7, you can do it. You know, I mean, that's the Australian that's the government market response. Con- the Australian government would contend that that's exactly what's currently happening with the Australian government being the owner of the system. Well, I mean, when was the last? I mean, <laughs> when was the last time we had an actually genuinely new TV station? Well, it looks like channel Channel Ten's going under, so I guess you could probably buy up Channel Ten Spectrum in a uh, in about two months. But whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Let's have a libertarian TV. Oh, you know what? Yes, we should go. Right. We should totally we need, talk we need to, to Gene Reinhardt. Yeah, that's it. Fat Gina stacks. We need Fat Gina stacks, and uh, <laughs> and uh, well, Murdoch wouldn't really give us fat stacks because he's kind of got a vested interest in the system. But uh, you never know. He's evil, and uh, libertarians are 
in his pocket. So we'll, well, we'll ideally, out. in an ideal world, we'd get Gina Fats, Gina Stacks, uh, and, and we're not calling Gina Reinhardt Fat. No, no, no. It's, we're, it's, we're talking it's, about like money. money, yeah, uh, and uh, Fat Stacks of money, and, and yeah. uh, what we're talking. So we'd be trying to get the money from her, and then on the other side, we'd be trying to get money from Soros. That way, <laughs> the two competing interests. Yes, that's would be, it. Yeah. So if you don't want to put immigrants to death on the spot, you are obviously a stooge of Soros. So yeah, it's a good point. We're, we're double stooges, stooges yep. for both sides. Yep, um, yep. Okay. And we were going to talk about something else. And now I forget what it is. The we citizenship about... test, man. Ah, yes, that's right. You, uh, of test. course you would know anything about it. Immigrants. Yeah. <laughs> of and course you are a filthy immigrant, Vickers, <laughs> and you have taken said test. Tell yeah. us how and why you are not patriotic. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. No, so this is um, – actually, I don't get the hullabaloo about this because everything everyone is talking about has already come into place. So, firstly, the test was compulsory. It used to be, Apparently, it used to be voluntary. I don't know, have any idea why we volunteered to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm confused. Yeah, by, yeah. Anyway, so the test became compulsory in 2006, and apparently it became English only in 2009. So, what the fuck are they changing? Like, everything in the media was like, we're going to overhaul the citizenship test. And then they said, like, like what? What are you going to do to it? And then they said, we're going to make it English only, except that's been a requirement since 2009. So... Well, I guess if you put out a, pro- a press release and say it's going to be English only, then it's a policy change, and you get to thump your chest. So, that's... On the on the upside, that's what you get to do. I mean... Yeah. To be perfectly I, I, honest, I don't think... Firstly, this test is a farce to begin with. Like... Yes. Like, yes, it is. Think, think about it. It's it's a set number of questions. You get a set number of answers. You get told what the answers are, right? I, I, I think if you really want to get down to it, like one of the biggest things, one of the biggest things that's like truly Australian is disagreeing with your government, but being reliant on them for a handout. That is the most Australian thing I can think of. Like yeah. literally the most Australian, if someone says like, what is the most Australian thing in your mind? It is basically a farmer with a welfare check in his hand going, I'm looking for a helping hand, not a handout. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this test is dumb. I think it's... And by I the way, to anyone who's offended by that, that is, I'm, I'm sorry, that is just the most Australian thing in my mind. I don't know what it is in yours. Well, we, we, we did have a lot of support within the, the welfare farming community, but now they're really going to be hating us. So thanks, Vickers, for syncing our show. Um... I mean, like, I think any sort of language-related test is kind of, in some ways, a little bit offensive just because of the history of white Australia and the use of the uh, the dictation test. So, anytime that they talk about this sort of stuff, there's part of me that just goes, please, d- just don't, because it's just, it was, yeah, if you look at how the dictation test was implemented, uh, it was essentially, uh, you, if they decided they didn't like you, they'd make you take this test, and you had to write, for some reason, they'd give it to you in a language... And uh, they get to choose the the language, and you have to yep. translate it into English. Yep. And they can just pick whatever they liked. You know, if you're German, they're like, "Oh, you can do it in Spanish, or you could do it in Ukrainian, or you can do it in whatever." Um, well, my fa- there was there was a guy who spoke about fourteen different languages, and they just kept giving him the test until he came across a language he didn't know, and then he failed it, and they kicked him out of the country. Like, ah, uh, so it's, sh- it was really disgusting. So they did change, yeah, yeah. So they did change that at some stage. I think it was like in 1940 something where you had to do where they, they could only do it once. They couldn't keep retesting him. Mm-hmm. And um, my cousin's grandfather from the mother's side, so they were Australian. Like they, like that that side of his family was Australian um, because they, you know, they migrated here in the 1960s. And when we asked them, like, okay, so how did you guys migrate here in the 1960s? And he goes, well. I just happened to have been in Italy in the 1950s, so he learned Italian. And for some reason, they thought he didn't know Italian when he got here. So they gave him mm-hmm. the test in Italian, and he passed it. So yep. he, he was just like, yeah, it was just lucky they picked Italian. If they picked German, yeah, he'd be like, fucked. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, uh, any, any kind of like, I mean, obviously, his English language requirement is different. But, I mean, really, it's a similar sort of thing where they're like, we want to weed out the unfit. Um, and... I mean, I don't think there should be a requirement to speak English in this country. I think it's great that you don't have to speak English. I think it's great that you can speak any language you like. I mean, that's the whole basis of freedom. Like, if you want to talk about free speech, this is really about free speech. This is about the ability to literally talk in whatever language you want to talk about in. And 
I think it's fine that there's Italian nonnas who don't know a word of English who sit there with their Italian nonna friends who they all came over on the same boat in the 50s and they live in their little enclave of Italians. Like, I think that's great. That's that's what it means to be free, is to be able to do that, as long as you don't hurt anybody else who gives a shit. Uh, forget um, freedom. So- it's actually a national security advantage. It actually yeah, makes it a lot point. harder to attack you as a country if you can speak the language of the, your opponents. I, yeah. to, quite frankly, this is something that I've always that nationalists have always confused me on because they are always like big on national security. They're big on all of that. One of the biggest problems, one of the biggest advantages the Germans had at the beginning of <laughs> at the beginning of World War Two was the fact that everybody in plain text communication spoke in languages that they understood. Right. The English could only fucking understand English. So the Germans, speaking German, right, there was only a small number of German-speaking people that could actually decrypt the messages, right? As as opposed yep. to the other side, where the Germans were used to speaking English, French, you know, and a whole host of other languages, and they had no trouble. From a national security perspective, right? Sorry, from a nationalist perspective, you make your country weaker by imposing a language restriction, which is why nationalists uh, have it asked backwards, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, in some ways, it's just it's this anti-immigration thing kind of boot through the back door. Like, if you really don't like immigrants, why not just you know stop them from coming here? Like, why have these stupid tests? Well, actually, like, that's that's just, what they want to do. That's actually yeah, that's, I mean, that's what they want to do, but it's it's uncouth to do it. I'd rather they just be up front and just say, well, we just don't want to let. I mean, it's not like we let a heap of immigrants in here to begin with. Um, I've, yeah, I think Australia is actually. I used to think Australia was pretty open to immigration, but I've, I think I, I come around to understand that no, actually, we don't let hardly anybody in. So just let less in, which is dumb, but whatever. Um, yep. At least that would be an honest, an honest approach to the to the policy. Cool. Um, so I think that's all right. Well, minutes. I think we're at thirty. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts? Nah, immigration tests suck. Yep, don't do it. And, okay, that's it for this week. Uh, We'll be back again next week with more discussion. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to us on Twitter. No, not on Twitter, sorry, on iTunes or YouTube. The other version, if you listen to the audio, subscribe to us on YouTube. If you listen to the the YouTube, subscribe to us on iTunes. And, uh, yeah, thanks. (laughs) That was a mock-up. But also, uh, you also forgot... Add us on Facebook. Oh, yes, that's it. We're on Facebook. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.